Okay. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Latin American webinar series run by Arabac, the Australia Latin American Business Council. My name is Marcelo Salas, and I am the CEO of Arabac. To those who are not familiar with Arabac, we are the big industry body in Australia, representing companies and organizations that are at the forefront of growing business link between Australia and the countries in the Latin American region. Today's webinar was organized by Alabac in collaboration with the Australia Chile Chamber of Commerce to discuss the challenges for business uh, sustainability in the new social context of Chile post pandemic and what that means for Australian companies. I would like to thank everyone for attending and showing your support and especially to our moderator and our distinguished panelists that generously donated their time and expertise on the subject today. Just, how, just some housekeeping to start off with. Firstly, we cannot see or hear any attendees as you are in the audience. If you have any questions, please write them directly in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you lose connection during the broadcast, please just re-enter the room using the same link you used before. Finally, we'll be, we will be recording this webinar and it will be available for you to access after the session. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands in which we gather today. I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And now I would like to give the floor to Leah Timson. Leah is the deputy foreign editor of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Over to you, Leah. Hello and good evening in Latin America. Good morning here in Australia. Thank you, Marcel. Um, and welcome to all our panel and our viewers from home and offices around the world. I'm very pleased to be hosting today's Stella Alabac panel. Three of the most prominent Chilean corporate leaders will share their views with you on how companies and organizations and governments can prepare to navigate Chile's business and social environment post pandemic. Your panelists today are Karen Poniacic. Karen has been a director of Columbia University's Global Center in Chile since September 2011. She's also a member of the board of directors of JetSmart Airlines, Inter-Chile, and the Chilean American Chamber of Commerce. She was Chile's um, Minister of Mining 2006-2008, when she also chaired the board of directors of state-owned companies called Delco, Enap, and Imani. She's also served as Minister of Energy and she was still as a special envoy to the OECD in charge of the country's accession to the uh, organization, which was successfully completed in 2010. That's a big achievement for a Latin American country and a, a, a point of pride for the country. Um, she has also served on the boards of Santiago Subway System, the Metro, and uh, amongst other companies. Christina Bittar is our other panel. Uh, Christina is a partner of Azerta, one of the most important strategic communications and public affairs agencies in Chile and Peru, and she specializes in leading a team to solve complex business crises, one of which we're right in the middle of now. Um, she looks at regulatory issues and is highly visible media issues for large corporate clients. She's also a director of AFP Provida, a MetLife company, and until April this year, served on the board of Newmont, the largest gold mining company in the world. Our third panelist is Claudia Bobadilla, a lawyer, company director, and social entrepreneur. She is the executive president of the Association for Private Tele Television Operations in Chile, a board member of Sinta Enel Distribution, that's the main energy distribution power grid in Chile, and of CSRO Chile, an Australian organization with an arm in Chile. Uh, she recently founded Quinti Social, or social bridge, whose aim is to help companies understand and reconnect with their social realities and responsibilities. She's also a trustee of the Board of Associate Universities in Washington. So, we are on a very tight schedule today and we have a lot to cover. Um, we will break down our chat into three loose themes and I'll um, give each of our panelists a few minutes to explore these themes while I'll ask questions of them and they of each other as well. It's a conversation. But I also want to leave enough time in the second half of our seminar to include your questions. And I want to leave you with some answers uh, or at least some ideas on how to tackle this post-pandemic world. So first we will look back. We'll look at the protests that rocked Chile and stunned the world starting uh, in October last year. Then we'll look at the present, where we sit now mid-pandemia 
still with the old economic problems and social unrest not solved, while accumulating a whole set of new problems brought on by the coronavirus. Then we'll look at the future, and this is where I want to spend most of the time today, and what we can realistically expect and what we can aspire to and when, hopefully. So let me begin with you, Karen. Looking back at the protests, you have a theory on what really drove the unrest beyond the 30 cent rise in train fares. And I start with you because you have served on the board of Santiago Metro, so you have some, a particular insight into that. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alabac, for the invitation. Good seeing you, Marcelo. We worked very closely when we were, we were both in government. I hope Jose is um, also tuned in. This is a very good friend. But to answer your question, you know, there was this slogan about it's not 30 pesos, it's 30 years. I do believe it's 30 pesos uh, because in Chile, one of the problems and one of the reasons why people are upset is because is uh, because of prices of goods and services going up at a time in which uh, wages were stagnant. So uh, that's probably the main reason. I don't believe the theory about the 30 years because until recently, people did have faith in the system. Let me just uh, quote uh, a survey by Universidad Católica, which is done every year. Uh, the question is, um, do you believe any individual can build an independent business? In 2009, 51% of people said yes. Today, it's only 27. Another question, do you believe the owner of a small business could turn it into a large and successful one? 49%, 2009, only 25% now. So I do believe that the problem is not the model, but the, it's, it's the way in which the model has been implemented, and we can talk about that. Other reasons, the frustration by a majority of Chileans who perceive they are not treated, treated with fairness and dignity. Dignity is a very important word. I hope we can talk about it during the seminar. Anger because the system has not been able to promote opportunities, inclusion, and mobility. And rage against corrupt politicians and business leaders. The latter have engaged in uh, malpractices. These are widely known. Price fixing, tax evasion, and other white color crimes and have gotten away with it. So just to wrap up, I don't think that this is a turn to the left, but a claim against the establishment perceived as being out of touch with reality. So I will leave it here now and maybe we can touch on some of these issues in the second round. Thank you, Karen. Yes, I'd like to, uh, to explore some of that a little bit more. And um, since you mentioned uh, uh, a word that's uh, been very much on my mind, um, I will uh, pass on to Claudia now, because you mentioned dignity. Claudia, you have a very interesting take on the reasons for the unrest. Um, you spent some time, 40 nights, I believe, with some of the very communities where the unrest started, um, eating, drinking with them, listening to their stories. What was your conclusion? Claudia? Now, I was mute. <laughs> what was your Hello. conclusion, Claudia, from your, your time yeah, with the communities? Yeah, be before to, give the, the, to, to, to share with you the conclusion, I, I have to, 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 to share with you that the, the purpose of uh, being uh, involved in the, in the center of the grassroots uh, has a reason. One of the biggest problems that, in my personal opinion, is underlying the whole the social unrest and certainly is present today in the pandemic, uh, is related to the, the big, profound disconnection that we, the elites, have been had uh, with, the, with the majority of the, the, the people, the citizens in general, at least to the 75% of our citizens. And this uh, social and geographical and structural disconnection has very uh, bad consequences. 
And one of those uh, bad consequences is that we tend, we tend, we from the elites, to understand and to um, interpret and to interpret the the reality from the macro perspective. I mean, from the macro figures, from a macro understanding, which is nothing to do, nothing to do, and I can say nothing to do after these 40 days in the grassroots with the, 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 the micro, which that means the, the, the reality of the daily life of the citizens. So when you have this uh, profound disconnection, this totally decoupled understanding from macro and the daily life, what you are uh, building is a profound discomfort, profound discomfort, anger, as Karen said, um, and also something which is very, very, very complicated, and we have to put the focus there, which is mistrust. All of the actors, all of the organizations across in our country are suffering of mistrust, with some exception, of course, which is one of them very important uh, under the social unrest, and right now in the pandemia, are the local governments. So this is connection this micro decoupled to the daily life, this, this uh, profound discomfort and this uh, mistrust is, uh, in my personal opinion, some of the key elements that has been responsible for the social unrest. Because when you are going to the grassroots, it's, not, it's nothing to do to read about overcrowding social houses. It's nothing to do about to read and about of the lack of uh, public spaces is nothing to do uh, uh, to do when you are reading about narco traffic, for example. It's nothing to do uh, about territorial inequality in terms of the budget that the local governments that are uh, dealing with the needs of the most vulnerable population. It's nothing to do papers and our understanding from the macro. It's nothing to do with what is happening in the real life and daily life of a citizen. So we have to put the focus there. How the elites, we all, has, have to comprehend and to go there and to see and to hear and to understand what is really happening in the majority of our population. Mm -hmm. Let me, um, thank you, thank you for that. I, I want to throw it to Christina now. Christina, um, do you think that the governments and um, business leaders were caught by surprise uh, by, the, by the protests? Were they um, as um, disconnected as we're hearing? I have, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Thank you, Leah, for uh, hosting us. And thank you for all the people that are, are watching us today uh, in, in the morning, as you say, in Australia and, and in the night in Chile. Um, I would answer yes. I think that what the social explosion that we experienced starting October was too big and too surprising for anybody to tell you that they knew what was coming. It is for me, I would call it the worst social and political crisis that Chile has faced in the last 35 years. Uh, it is pretty contradictory and I think your question is right and you go exactly to the point because we, uh, uh, like Karen was saying, had a model that was so successful for the last three or decades and a half that had made, gave political economic stability to Chile. We reduced poverty rates from 29% to 8%. We controlled inflation. We had, uh, attracted foreign investment, uh, had democratic elected uh, administrations and great growth. So how can we have from there gotten to where we got? And that is very big and it's not so easy to explain, I guess we still are struggling with finding answers. And I think Claudia's work in grassroots is part of that. How do we go and find the answers? And I would just like to share just a few things that I think are important. I think inequality in Chile 
inequality expressed in terms of the difference between the richest and the poorest is still, unfortunately, after all the decades of growth and a, a wide improvement for Chile, is still, it has been very difficult to move and we it's very stubbornly high and we are the highest uh, according to world bank and the highest uh, gini coefficient in in the oecd uh, definitely all lives of all chileans have improved but the gap between rich and poor is still high i think the consolidation of an emerging middle class full of aspirations demanding better quality of the services, better of education and better pensions, uh, better wages is definitely contradictory to what they were feeling. And uh, they ended up feeling that the privatized education, the healthcare and the pension systems uh, were favoring the more wealthy people and definitely leaving them behind and indebted. Uh, additionally, I think Claudia said it, the fragmented political system that we have in the last few years in Chile, a highly polarized system uh, is definitely tensioning. And there is an extreme discontent between and disconnect between the political citizen, the political system and the citizens. And that politicians have declined the faith uh, and, and, and have not been able to solve the problems that people are requesting and therefore losing a lot of credibility. Uh, to add to that, the Congress, the government has no majority in Congress, so they can't pass the bills and it's very difficult. Every day it's getting worse. I just, I don't want to make a huge list, but I just want to give you all the feeling of what happens. This is very complex and we have also very debilitated institutions and credibility of other forces like the police, the armed forces, businesses, media, among others, and business scandals like, uh, like, she, like uh, Karen said, corruption scandals, collusion cases, were, have also eroded the faith in the country's political and corporate elite. Uh, together with lower growth rates in the last few years and the commodity boom that probably uh, stopped uh, or the prices started to go down, that gave us less money for government to give uh, in, in social welfare. So that cocktail of issues together with a more empowered citizenship probably uh, also added with more anti-systemic activists, which definitely are there. We cannot, we cannot avoid that, but that's not the center, have made this social explosion so so important and so necessary to, to look at and to comprehend and to resolve in order for the future of Chile to be successful. Thank you. Um, that's, that's very comprehensive. Um, I, I want to spend um, a little bit of time talking about these, uh, these reasons and what we can, um, what, what we can expect, but we'll, we'll do that a little bit more on the, uh, when we're doing more Q and A. Um, I want to throw back at you now, um, looking at where we are now, none of those problems um, that you three have so well uh, explained have been solved. They've, they were all suspended when the pandemic arrived. So now we have problems that um, have been festering, we can say, for 30 years, came to a head and then got hit by the pandemic. Um, let's talk about that because when we said that the, the model was working, the model was clearly working for some of the people, uh, but the rest of the population or some of the population felt that it wasn't working for them. Um, now, th th that's one of the, the, the things in that is that inequality that is so profound and it's so uh, visible that inequality is also being uh, credited, if you like, with um, some of the reasons why the pandemic has hit Chile so hard. Now, Chile is not the highest in the number of cases, but it is in fact the worst rate of cases per million of population. So it's even worse than the United States. We've got yesterday, there were 15,616 cases per million inhabitants, where in the United States, there are 9,000. So that's a very sobering 
um, statistic. And I want to ask you, why um, do you think that uh, the pandemic has hit the, the government, the, the, uh, the country so hard? How bad is the situation indeed, uh, Karen, first? Well, thank you for the question. I'm not an epidemiologist, so I will answer uh, more from uh, what I've seen. Um, a couple of reasons. Um, it has spread more in neighborhoods or in communas, as we call them, eh, which are the poor uh, communas where people live in overcrowded, homes are overcrowded. So there is a reason there. There is inequality in terms of the community. But there are other reasons. Uh, some millennials are partying, eh, even though there is total prohibition to do it. Some people going out of their homes, even though you can't. So there's a little bit of everything, but I think the inequality is um, one of the factors that has hit um, us during this pandemic. If I may pick up on something that Christina said, uh, I want to talk for a few minutes, or for a few yeah, a minute or two, about a new generation of inequalities. So we know about what the income inequality access to education inequality, um, pension inequality, but there's also an equality tied to, and I'm going to pick this word up again, dignity. Uh, and I want to quote a survey by the UNDP. UNDP. Uh, people, 41% of responders said that they had suffered some kind of abuse for the previous year due to their social class, due to because they're women, because of where they lived, or the way they were dressed. So in other words, classism and misogyny also can explain a, an important way why people are so angry, besides the reason we have uh, talked about. Um, again, um, just to, I usually tend to uh, use a lot of, uh, studies. And just to close here, I want to give you a figure which is quite staggering. This is a report written by Seth Zimmerman from Chicago University and showing that 1.8 of all students in college and university, that is 1.8, which are men from two universities, Universidad de Chile, Universidad Católica, that studied three careers in law, engineering, and business, and that come from seven schools, that 1.8% currently uh, accounts for more than 40% of leadership positions. So we can see also why people feel so angry in regards to social mobility or exclusion. So the model really wasn't working. <laughs> Um, it's very sad. Um, on, on that inequality, um, how, uh, Christina, do you think the um, authorities in the corporate sector have handled uh, the, the, the pandemic, the post-protest post or this is suspended protest time and the pandemic well? Um, what, what is the country doing to address the, uh, the pandemic, apart from, obviously, we've, we've heard uh, the, uh, the difficulties um, with the, um, the lockdown. Um, give, give us an idea of what's happening on the ground uh, and how it's being handled by the authorities. It's been, it's been troubling, Leah. Uh, it's, it's not easy, not easy at all to, to handle something so unexpected so new and so unstabilizing. This government had already been hit by the October social crisis and this pandemic just came on top and hit it harder. At the beginning, I would say, uh, I would say what they did well was to prepare the health system, integrate the public and the private system to have enough beds, enough uh, machines in order to attend uh, people that get complicated with the virus, they displayed 
very in advance, a lot of infrastructure. And I think until today, uh, we have had a lot of demand in hospitals and, and, and in the private in attention in the different health sectors, but there has not been a collapse like we saw in Europe. And I think that the government did well. Uh, unfortunately, they, because of the, the, uh, the tension between uh, closing up and locking down the population and slower economics, they tended at the beginning to be more optimistic about the, the pandemic. So they were not uh, so strong in communicating that people should stay at home. And probably that is what made this spread so badly. Today, our, our numbers are slowly coming down. I think we're having re bit, a lot of better news. We're starting to see certain parts of the country that can be opened up again, uh, starting the end of this week. So yeah, definitely it has not been perfect. Uh, it has not uh, been, but I would say that in terms of the health system, they have done a good job in terms of infrastructure and attention for, uh, for patients. Uh, probably communicationally, they should have been probably louder and more exaggerated but I guess uh, it was firmer, they did do that as well. They, exactly. Yeah. Um, Claudia, have there been some examples where interventions or actions may have helped? Um, have, from, from what you see in the grassroots, um, how, how are the interventions um, and the programs working? Yeah, very good question. And, and before to answer you, Leah, just a few remarks about uh, to having a, a more global perspective about the pandemic and then going uh, locally, uh, if we look globally, we, we are seeing that the poorest country are, are those that are suffering, are struggling more with this pandemic. However, when you are uh, looking at of the developed countries or middle developed countries, and you are, uh, you are doing a zoom in into them, you are looking at that the poorest communities are what those that are suffering and are struggling the most. So the, the, to be poor as a country or as a community is a thing that we have to address. Uh, it's a matter of the highest importance uh, because what the, what the social unrest has to reveal to us in Chile uh, is getting deeper under this pandemic. Plus, a huge unemployment, plus hunger, plus cold, we are in winter. So this, uh, this comfort and this trust in the institution is going deeper and deeper, first of all. So back to your question, uh, it's, it's very paradoxically, because even though uh, we are, the, the government has been deploying a very robust package of, uh, of help to the, to, to the, to the, the whole community, uh, medium-sized and uh, small enterprises, middle-class, uh, people unemployed, uh, even though the package um, is, uh, is robust and the majority of the measures are well-designed and are well-focused, if you are going to the grassroots, I am in permanent contact with the grassroots, they are not perceiving this measure as good measures. Again, 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 you are seeing this decoupling between the, 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 the government measures in this case and what the uh, citizens are perceiving this measure, uh, which, is, which are not responding to, to what they are, wait, they are uh, expecting to, to receive. So this is a very complicated scenario. So then the, the, the need of going uh, at the, in the grassroots and to meet the people and to hear the people and to know their priorities is essential. Because when we are talking about dignity, it's not about dignity just related to the social demands, to the economical demands. It's more profound that, that, than that. When we talk with the people at the grassroots, what they're saying to us, we don't need help. We need to be part of the construction of this new society, society of this new uh, 
a social project. We need to be part of that. Of that. So this is the challenge, how we, are, we will be able to build a social project that we all feel part of. And, there, and, and it's there when, when dignity is, is at the center. So one of the things that uh, personally, as a, an, as a Puente Social, we, we believe is a matter of uh, uh, urgency, is to put dignity at the core of the decisions, at the core of the public policy, at the core of the organizations, the human dignity as the core, as at the center of every, every organization. Plus an ethics context and plus going, and there is no shortcut, going to the communities, go, going to the grassroots and to hear, to learn, because it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of uh, knowledge, it's a lot of experience, and who else than the, the, than the people that is living and is suffering the problems knows better what are the priorities and certainly working together it will be a much better solution than working from the top to the bottom i think we, ha we have to change that and going to the bottom to the top and um, and having an encounter in the in, in the in the middle yeah let's let, let's talk about that um a, a little bit um one of the things that is um historically um, apparent is that uh, in the middle of a crisis uh, like this, incumbent governments tend to do well. Um, the population, once, um, it, once the population is, um, understands what the problem is and gets through it somehow, incumbent governments tend, unless they absolutely stuff it up, as some governments um, are doing right now, um, incumbent governments and incumbent leaders tend to come out well. I'm just wondering whether um, the government in Chile now, which was under so much pressure during the protests and will likely continue to be when, uh, when, when this finishes, um, is whether the population is going to cut them a little bit of slack, whether they, they, they will perhaps understand uh, the difficulty and whether the government might um, actually improve in its standing with the population post pandemic. Um, you saying that, um, that the people um, are still very unhappy with the situation. And even though the, the, the package that's being rolled out is, as you said, very robust, um, is, aren't some people going to think that perhaps, you know, the government is trying to do the right thing? Karen? Uh, just uh, to mention about popularity, uh, during the pandemic, by the end of the year, the popularity of President Piñera was about 6%, and it has gone up. Uh, it's about 40%, it goes up and down three points. So it has gone up. However, uh, it, however, people are still upset, as, as, as Claudia and, and Christina well described. So what's, um, it's not that the, the, the problem here is it's political crisis, because uh, I don't think the government is capable of um, promoting the dialogue or the agreements needed to um, solve the problems. And I don't think the opposition is, um, and the opposition, I can hear the latest uh, surveys about popularity, they're, they're in the bottom. I don't think the opposition can offer an alternative. So our challenge here is to find the way in which conduct this dialogue that would lead to solve all these problems. Uh, who's going to participate in this dialogue? Who is going to lead it? And that's a problem uh, because at this point, um, the elites obviously uh, cannot do it. The political elites cannot do it. 
Um, business elites, of course, cannot do it. Uh, I was surprised yesterday reading that the president of the largest, uh, of the second largest uh, business association said they were working on a roadmap. They do. That's a roadmap, That's a roadmap without exit. the population? I don't think they talked uh, to the people that, for instance, are talking to Claudia, which is, you know, a bad way on, on how to address uh, the challenges. So we, in addition to that, traditional media also has lost revenue. So the issue is finding who will lead uh, this dialogue and uh, I will be able to reach some sort of agreement because we need to reach some sort of agreement. And one last thought, I don't think it's the model. I think, because I still believe in capitalism, I, don't, I, I think that what has happened is the way in which the model has been conducted. Uh, Luigi Singales, uh, who is in Chile, he's a very well-known economist in the US, he talked about Chile is not capitalism. Chile is a crony capitalism system. It's a country club capitalism system. They have a crunch club mentality. So the elite controls positions of power and not only uh, economy, but also in some areas has co-opted the government. And I will just end with this. Um, people dis are distrust, distrust uh, both government and Congress because they see how special interests, let's say notaries, uh, do not allow uh, both government and opposition to vote for a major reform of the notarial Ontario system, which will benefit citizens who will not have to go to the notary to sign a paper and will be, you know, and, and instead could do their um, paperwork from home. So people realize all that. So, so we have to think how we will be able to address uh, and these challenges, who can lead the process, and uh, at what speed. We have a parenthesis today, which is an epidemic, but I think that once this is solved, or if it, if it is solved, it, it is going to be solved once we have the vaccine. But after that, I think social movement riots will start again. Yes, um, let's, you, you, you. You made a, a, a very good point to start us on, uh, on the, the third uh, theme of today, which is the future, right? Um, I want to ask you, obviously, the recon th there's going to be a reconciliation. Uh, there's going to be to need to be a reconciliation process. Let's talk about the referendum, because that was one of the demands from the protests, um, to bring the, the, uh, the constitution to present day Chile as a starting point. That has been postponed once already. It's now uh, scheduled for October. Uh, as with everything in this pandemic, we don't see how things can happen, <laughs> you know, at this side of Christmas, anywhere around the world. Um, Christina, let me start with you. How is, um, is the referendum going to, to happen in your uh, point of view this time of Christmas or at all? And how um, can it or something else contribute to the future, the reconciliation of the, this, these uh, two sides of the, or Chile, the country club and the people on the ground? Okay. Um, well, I personally think that the future or the near future for Chile is going to be very difficult. It's going to be more difficult than for the rest of the world in a post-pandemic world because we have been carrying, as you say, the social outburst. Regarding the way out, I don't think there's, we need one leader or, we, or we're going to be able to find anybody to, to lead this uh, and I totally believe that the constitutional process that starts with the referendum is probably the opportunity to take control of Chile's future. And why, why I say, I say that for, uh, 
because not because I love to be in the position we are, but because it is really for me the only chance we can initiate a process of dialogue where we can get a shock of the magnitude that we have together with the social and political crisis, plus the economic crisis that we will have post pandemic and make everybody reflect on what type of society and institutions we want for the future, how we would like things to work, how we need things to work, including the role of the economy and businesses in this process. The Chilean elites, as, they, as Claudia and Karen have said, are facing a critical moment in history. And definitely this is an opportunity. So I, I do believe, I don't think that the referendum will take place in October but it will be delayed a few months. We will have a referendum and we need to draft a new constitution uh, for the country. And I see there the possibility to draft this new social contract for Chile. This is definitely has multiple risks. I'm not saying it is risk free, but the rules that were agreed in November by the majority of the par parties that agreed to this constitutional process and referendum uh, incorporates a two-thirds majority uh, in everything that is drafted. So that will force a construction of broad consensus that will definitely reduce risks that we certainly see and are worried about. But I think that should help us exercise more reasonable positions uh, in, in the overall context. Um, how we manage to reach a consensus on the correct response and give the correct responses to the Chilean demands, uh, together with the economic uh, crisis that we will face with a lot more people unemployed, definitely a poorer country after the pandemic, is definitely what will determine the governance and the future of our society. I'm not saying that we won't have a, future, a good future. I'm just saying that these next two years are very important. And just to add, it is very important that these next two years of constitutional process are also filled of elections. We're going to have from October or whenever the referendum comes till the presidential election, eight national elections that will take place in these next few months. So that creates more uncertainty, more un instability, more polarization, and definitely makes it a little bit more complicated, but we will choose district, regional, legislative, and presidential uh, candidates in the next few months, and the electoral uh, uh, panorama will change completely. Uh, that referendum also will change, and I think that constitutional process will also give us a new framework for the Chile of the future, and I am positive that we Chileans are going to go and use this possibility of using the constitution as a reconstruction for the society. And I hope it is, I, I think it could be successful to, to tell you. I would like to know Claudia's and Karen's opinion. As yes, well. um, I, I was going to ask Claudia the same thing. Um, it sounds like a lot of hope is being um, uh, hung on uh, this constitutional process, which you've got to start somewhere and this is something that people have already agreed to. Um, how will, and of course you can't speak for, for, for all of the grassroots population um, and um, as you say you're part of the elite yourself but you have a little bit more of an insight into uh, people have, what people have told you on, uh, on the streets. Are they also hopeful the referendum will help redraw a future for Chile, Claudia? Very good question. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, just to, to add something which is important, plus to the three crises that simultaneously we are living for right now, which is the, the, the social unrest, the pandemic and the economical crisis, we're also facing a crisis of leadership. And this is very important to understand. The uh, reason why I can say who will be leading this transformation. Um, we are facing a crisis of leadership and, 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 and also no one by, by their own will be solving anything. That uh, this challenge needs the cooperation of all of the, all of the stakeholders, of all of the, the citizens 
the business sector, the governmental sector, the ONGs, etc., etc., etc. So leaderships will be coming up from different sectors. And, and regarding your question, what I really understood being at the grassroots and spending uh, more, the, more than 100 conversations with more, more than 400 people is they see the, the, the constitutional process just as the first step. The first step for being uh, uh, here on their needs but they're not looking the, the, the constitutional process as the way to solve their needs, which is different. They said the constitutional reform and the process that we are setting the process is a way that our voice can be present. Because as they don't trust in the political class, they said we have to have a voice there, but we are not solving the big problems. So the big problem will remain there and we will be continue uh, mobilizing ourselves for uh, tackling this problem, which are essentially health system, educational system, minimum wage and, pension, and, and the pension funds. So, so it is very important. I totally agree with, with Christina. The worst thing, it will be not having the constitutional uh, reform and discussion because that will be a, 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 a tremendous uh, problem for, for the country. But it's just perceived from the grassroots as the first step, and then we have other challenges to, to address. Mm -hmm. and, and in this way, uh, thinking in the future, uh, I, I, I am totally uh, convinced, uh, really convinced, intellectually and emotionally convinced, that as we have been putting a lot of efforts and investment building the physical infrastructure of our country, the digital infrastructure as well, which is becoming more and more relevant, uh, and, it's, and it's evident in this pandemic, we have to work now in, 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 the, in, in the relationship infrastructure. We have to... Oh. I think we lost uh, Claudia there. Um, I'm going to throw it to you, Christina, because I've got a, I've actually got a question from uh, from one of our viewers today. Um, is there a risk that uh, the referendum um, may be that the elite, as everyone calls it, uh, the political elite, can use the the referendum process to maintain power and avoid changes? Uh, I I don't I, I will go ahead and answer while Claudia con reconnects. I think there there is a low risk in that happening because the referend the way that the most conservative elites can uh, block the constitutional process is by winning the referendum. And by winning the referendum, that means that the majority of Chileans needs to go and vote and say they don't want a constitutional change. And that's almost impossible. They're the majority of Chileans uh, in all the, all the uh, polls and in all the uh, public opinion uh, in, in, <laughs> Sorry. That, that, that come out, definitely they are saying that they are going to vote. They want, a, they want to approve a constitutional process to move forward. We will have to know whether it is 50% new people and 50% Congress people or 100% new people. That is the type of things that we will know as well. But I don't see how uh, the, the conservative elites can win, even though they're going to do very strong campaigns. And, and I understand it. They come from fear. They don't want change. It's difficult. But, but, but this is the only way out, I think, for Chile at this point. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I am back. Sorry. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Um, as Claudia mentioned, um, the um, this all, all stakeholders have, have to be involved uh, in this. And obviously, um, some of our some of the the stakeholders are watching us tonight and uh, or this morning, and uh, are very interested in finding out what is it that they can do uh, to 
to navigate uh, this process, not just the political process, but the economic process that will result from it. Karen, can I go to you first, please? Um, can you um, tell me, as, as board member, as previous uh, former minister, what can uh, the corporate sector do uh, in this new world? Um, how can they help and, uh, and what should they be watching for? Thank you for the question. That's an issue that we have been working uh, very, that we have been talking about at Columbia University in Santiago uh, a lot since the last two years. And it has to do with the change of paradigm. Most companies in Chile still uh, believe the, Phil, the Milton Friedman mantra that profits is what the, the role of the company is to make profits. I think the private sector through their companies can make a change by reflecting uh, on what's their purpose and uh, to put not the uh, not everything on the bottom line or in the profits but also on what sort of contribution they're making uh, to society what are the goods and services they are providing that will help uh, Chileans solve the problem. So I think there is an important, uh, an important role for the private sector. Uh, um, from that point of view, I see uh, foreign investment is key because companies from the US, from Australia, um, of course, have higher standards and better practices with this regards than our Chilean companies which some are starting to, to change. But um, I think in general, the elite uh, needs to loosen its grip on political and economic power. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, I don't believe the constitution reform will change uh, things dramatically. Um, I think they will, lower, they will lower the social pressure, but uh, Constitutional changes are not going to change the mentality. They're not going to change the way people are treated. Can you believe in Chile still, at many companies, uh, the CEOs and the, you know, the top tier have one dining room and the workers have a different dining room? Uh, you know, we have to change that. Uh, so it's not a matter of changing the constitution only. It's a matter of changing the attitudes. and. And we do need, uh, and we have a huge um, challenge there. Um, we need to leave behind that country uh, club mentality and start working with a different paradigm. We need more competition. We need the modernization of the state, which is a huge challenge. We need more transparency. We need to work on how to increase productivity. That's not going to be solved. Uh, by a constitutional process, in my opinion. Uh, so I think that all of us in the elite, uh, uh, you know, should reflect on this and figure out how are we going to change ourselves and how we deal with every stakeholder. Because we are a minority and the rest of our stakeholders are the majority. One uh, personal, uh, you know, experience to share I was in the board of Metro uh, when we inaugurated Line 6, which connected uh, the center of Santiago, Providencia, to um, suburban uh, neighborhoods, which were very poor, Cerrillos, for example, and Pedro Aguirre Cerda. Um, when we opened up, you know, it was very nice uh, ceremony um, uh, led by President Bachelet at that time. When people came uh, from Cerrillos, for example, or from Pedro y Reserva, the doors were open, they were crying because they will have Metro, you know? Instead of traveling three hours to their jobs, Metro would take them to, uh, in 20 minutes to their jobs. So that is dignity. And we should think in which way other companies uh, can work in order to provide that which is not going to be provided by a constitutional reform. So let me ask you, um, uh, Christina and, and Claudia, um, 
the boards you belong to. What, if, uh, we're running out of time actually, so I'm gonna ask you to, to give me a very brief answer. Tell me one thing you'd like the boards you are on now to do to ensure that this process um, is going to um, give some assurances to both the, the, the population, uh, the future of Chile and the people doing business in Chile. What's, what's the one or two things that you'd like to, your boards to, to do? Christina, if, you can, if I can start with you. Well, I, I think uh, I, the business sector in general has a good opportunity in this crisis. Uh, I, I personally think more than ever after the pandemic, we're gonna need investment like Karen was saying, we're gonna need uh, people to, to do the, thing, the business uh, as, as usual. And I think there's going to be an opportunity to do better business here. But at the same time, what we need is to uh, make a difference, show people that the business private sector is very important in their lives, which is something that probably we have lost. There's a lot of interest that the state grows and gives me everything. But at the end of the day, it's the private sector that is doing, giving the main uh, uh, jobs uh, and income for the country. And I think it's time for companies to be able to communicate better, to inform better, to dialogue and to be flexible, to adapt to these new changes. Uh, take care of their workers, which is number one, number two, number three, in every sense of the way. But I would say workers and consumers have to be at their center uh, for sure. But I think it brings opportunities for the business sector to reposition itself in a better position than what we are today. Thank you. Claudia? Yeah, very concrete because I, I want to take the, the concept of dignity and to, and, to, and to say and to explain why, how we can, we can uh, deploy dignity within the organizations. And I, I am, I, I, it, it, it appears to be very hard to be optimistic, but uh, I have a lot of hope in the future. And I, 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 am, I am seeing in real examples right now at the corporate level, uh, very strong changes. And one of them is the following. We have to understand that the social aspect that we are managing from the companies can not be in the, in the borders, in the fringe of the company. Social, the social dimension should be at the same level at the, finan at the financial dimension, at the regulatory dimension, at the environmental dimension, at the technological dimension. So that means social dimension should be at the core of the strategy. So, uh, doing that, we have to align our processes, we have to align and to reflect about the skills that we need at the company, we have to realign the, the incentives for the people, so we are moving to a cultural transformation. This is what we need within the organizations. It's not a matter of uh, giving something uh, having transaction, transaction, so, so, uh, transactional uh, relationship is a totally different concept. It's putting the social dimension at the core of the strategy at the same level of the financial dimension. Because if we're not doing that, the social uh, movement and the social dynamism of the social movement and complexity of the social movement will be anyway having impact in the financial performance of the company. And if we are not having social cohesion, peace, and, 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 uh, and sustainability as a country, as a democracy, the viability of our business will be uh, on, under risk. So when I am seeing the companies moving forward to this new way of understanding the social dimension within the companies at the core of the strategy, I, I am very optimistic and I, I have hope about our future uh, looking at these changes that are already happening in some of the companies to whom I belong. That's, that's um, an excellent point to end on, actually. Uh, we are running out of time. I'm glad um, you left us with um, a, a bit of hope. Uh, we spent a bit of time talking about the past um, and the problems um, that we currently 
uh, facing as well. Um, I was left with, after um, our conversation, uh, with, with hope myself um, that uh, the process uh, of uh, the referendum, um, not that it will solve everything, but it will provide an opportunity for dialogue and an opportunity for uh, re-evaluation. Um, if there's anything that uh, we've, we've gained with the pandemic, I think we've gained time. Uh, people were very, um, very uh, needy of time uh, before. Well, we have it now. Um, we're all locked in and, uh, and have a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to think. The other thing I think we've gained as well is that um, uh, not only businesses, but uh, I think people and, uh, and companies are less risk averse. I don't know that that will be a permanent state of affairs, but um, we've thrown out um, all the uh, old requirements to test everything to death and spend months and years uh, planning. Uh, things and we pivoted and launched new products, uh, uh, tested new ideas, and uh, started reevaluating things uh, with less caution. Um, not uh, not to be on the dangerous side, but because you know there's so little to lose when uh, everything's locked down and the economy is taking a battering. So um, I think the um, the referendum and the opportunity to uh, have a dialogue. Uh, together with what we are um, experiencing, the pandemic will leave people um, with. I would like to see it leave people with an opportunity to reevaluate and look at the future. And uh, I'm quite hopeful, uh, having listened to you, uh, that uh, there is an opportunity for that to happen in Chile. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to the other the other questions. Uh, I'd like to um, propose to Marcelo that uh, we answer those questions. Those questions are passed around. Uh, there are quite a few, and I'm just going to ask you one more, uh, but I just want a show of hands, um, if you can. Um, many viewers want to know if the three of you will be uh, part of uh, the convention for the referendum. If I can just have a yes or no, please. <laughs> Not in my case. <laughs> I, I would love to. <laughs> no, Claudia would be an uh, excellent representative. Okay, um, it sounds like uh, it's really in the, in the hands of, uh, of our viewers and, uh, and the, the grassroots and the, the, the politicians. So um, please, thank you uh, very much for taking part today. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure hosting you and uh, till next time. Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much. Marcelo. Thank you very, you very much, everyone. Thank you, thank Marcelo. you Leah. Thank you, Marcelo. Thank, thank you, Karen and, and Christina. It has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you all uh, thank a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Bye. And yeah, we, we still have people disconnecting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leah. That was um, great. It was fantastic webinar.